Tinakoto Katoa and welcome everybody. Lovely to see you here today. Um, um, ko Kali Mosi Atoko Ingoa. I'm the Policy and Advocacy Manager at the New Zealand Drug Foundation. Uh, welcome to the fourth in our series of webinars on the Cannabis Legalisation and Control Bill. Um, for those who don't know the Drug Foundation, um, we are a charitable trust based here in Wellington, um, independent of the government. Um, and one of our many roles is to facilitate community discussions around topics relating to drug law. Um, and as you'll know, there's a referendum on 19th of September about whether we should legalize adult use of cannabis. Um, and this live chat is a, is a part of a series that we've been running to get into, into the policy around that um, bill in depth. Um, and this session is looking at the really important topic of um, what the impact on young people would be from cannabis legalization. So welcome. Um, I'm going to introduce our amazing panel in just a minute um, and get the conversations going, but a few housekeeping things first. Um, please feel free to introduce yourself um, via the chat function, which you can see down the bottom of your screen, if you're using a laptop that is. Um, let us know where you're calling from. Um, you're welcome to say hello and swap notes with other people who are watching. Um, unlike a Zoom meeting, you, we can't hear you or see you, um, you're completely switched off, but we can um, talk to you through the chat function and if you have questions for us, you can use that Q&A uh, function down the bottom of your screen. And you can also, I believe, play with your screens to have different speaker views so that you can see um, and, and to move the screen around a wee bit, so just feel free to have a play. <clears throat> also behind the scenes we've got Stephen who's our um, moderator and Tom, who's our tech guru, um, helping out. Um, so yes, let me introduce the wonderful panelists. Um, I'll start with you, Tania. Tanaki, Tania Sawiki Mead is the director of Just Speak, um, which is, of course, a youth-powered movement for transformational change in the criminal justice system. And um, Just Speak has an amazing record in um, standing up for criminal justice issues, um, including raising the age of the um, youth justice system, advocating for the right of prisoners to vote. Um, and of course, they're also involved in campaigning for the legalization of cannabis at the referendum. Tanya studied at Victoria and also has an MA from the University of British Columbia in political science. And she's worked in community development, human rights policy and political communication. So Morena Tanya, do you want to um, introduce yourself quickly and maybe tell us a little bit about why the cannabis referendum is important to you and to just speak? Hello, Morena Koto. Um, <clears throat> sorry, you have to excuse me that I'm a bit sick. So if my voice starts to crack, um, it's it's not, I'm, I'm not being overwhelmed with emotion. <laughs> Just a virus wreaking havoc. <coughs> havoc. Um, uh, yeah, so thanks for having me today. Really looking forward to the corridor. Um, we have been uh, collaborating with a few different parties here on the call around um, the campaign for Yes Vote at the referendum. So it's exciting to see um, kind of the momentum building up on that. Um, just Speak has long kind of advocated for the, the legalization and decriminalization of, of, um, of illicit substances because we know that that is a huge driver of young people in particular into our justice system. And we think that a health-based approach is one of the most powerful ways that we can undo the harm that our criminal justice system does, particularly to young people. Um, so we were very excited to see when the, the referendum was announced and we're really hopeful that we can build a movement of people from all across the Motu to um, with you know all the various and many reasons why uh, legalization is a good idea <coughs> um, to kind of build momentum for change for positive change at the at the referendum. So kia ora. Great, welcome. Um, Joe. So Joe Bowden um, is director of the Christchurch Health and Development Study and he trained as an experimental social psychologist and he's worked in the United States, United Kingdom and Australia before coming to New Zealand. Um, very lucky to have him. So the Christchurch um, study is a longitudinal study that you may have heard of. It's been in existence for I think over 40 years um, following the health and education and lifestyle, life progress of a group of more than a thousand um, children who were born in 1977, I think it was in Christchurch. And they've got a wealth of information from that research and most relevantly for our conversation here today, they've got a huge amount of information on how cannabis um, affects young people's health and other life outcomes. So great to have you here, Joe. Um, Joe's also a member of the Prime Minister's Chief Science Advisor um, Expert Panel on Cannabis, which hopefully will be publishing their report um, on cannabis soon. So kia ora, Joe, do you want to introduce yourself briefly and tell us why the referendum is important to you um, given your work and research? Kia ora, Kali. Um, Morena, and to, to all, 
This has been an important um, aspect of research in the Christchurch Health and Development Study since the cohort members were 15 years old and they're 43 now. And we've collected 25 years of data on cannabis use and outcomes related to it. Um, but why this is so important to me is, is really th three things. Um, that, that all the data we've collected and the things that we found have um, about cannabis related harms have all occurred in a, in a situation where cannabis is a prohibited subject, uh, prohibited substance and 80% of our cohort has used it at some point, which means the law doesn't stop people getting access to it. When you, people who are arrested or convicted, 95% of them went on to either continue their cannabis use or increase their cannabis use, which means that the force of the law being enacted upon you doesn't deter you. Um, and also um, Maori cohort members are three times more likely to be arrested or convicted of a cannabis offense than non-Maori, uh, which means the law is being applied in a racially biased manner, which means the law is not fit for purpose. And uh, we need to look at a health approach, which would do much better for all New Zealanders. Kia ora, welcome. Um, our next panelist is Isabella lenahan Aiken, and she is national president of the New Zealand Union of Students Associations. Um, which is, of course, the national representative body for tertiary students um, at universities and polytechnics in Aotearoa. Um, Isabella has recently completed her undergraduate study in biomedical sciences at Victoria in Wellington. Um, she's also insanely talented. She's going off to be a Rhodes Scholar um, and do a Master's of International Health and Tropical Medicine in Oxford shortly. Um, Isabella, I really, really hope you can still go given the whole, whole thing with COVID-19. Um, Please, could you quickly introduce yourself? And um, also, I hear that the New Zealand um, Students Association is promoting a yes vote at the cannabis referendum. That's a, a new thing, I believe. Can you tell us what spurred that decision? Yeah, tēnā koe, Carly. Thank you very much for having us on. Um, Morena koutou. Um, so I'm Isabella Lenahanaiken, National President of the New Zealand Union of Students Association. And as Carly said, we're really proud to be supporting a yes vote. I think fundamentally our vision for tertiary education, um, which we have been working hard to achieve over the last 91 years, is around a barrier-free education for all people in Aotearoa, whether they're young people or not. Um, we believe that education is a social good, it's a public good, um, and we, therefore we believe that it has the ability to really transform our communities and change lives. I think there's a couple of reasons why we see um, really great alignment um, with this issue from our organisation's perspective. I think, um, you know, typically the majority of students are young people and young people are overrepresented in terms of um, our interaction with the archaic drug laws of this country. Um, and so I think it's really important that we that we take a standpoint on, on this issue. There is this massive opportunity to change the way that we um, you know, deal with drugs and we can change this archaic system. And I think that's really exciting. Um, I think the other thing, as all panelists will agree with me, is that it's about a harm reduction approach. Obviously, we see education as being a public good that has the ability, is obviously not a silver bullet, but has really has the ability to change our communities. And if I can think about an example of, um, you know, when I was at school and we had students um, my, my school did this wonderful public health approach in terms of drugs. They accepted that young people were using drugs and that instead of, um, you know, kicking people out of the education system, they welcomed people and had a very inclusive um, harm reduction approach to the way that they responded. And that's actually what we need to do across all of society. And that meant that these students weren't kicked out of the education system and they weren't prevented from realizing their dreams, whether that be going into employment or into tertiary education. And fundamentally, that's the approach that I and, and the organization that I come from want to see rolled out across all of Aotearoa. Thanks, Isabella. Sorry, my sound just went off for a second there. Yeah. <laughs> um, Kia ora, um, mama e roa, Marito is our last, last but not least. Um, she's currently in a second term as the Tumuaki or co-president of Te Mana Ākonga, which is the National Māori Tertiary Students Association. Um, in her role, mama e roa is focused on advocating for improved experiences and outcome for tauera Māori and tertiary education. And she is also a Kia Piki Te Ora coordinator at Te Runanga o Ngāti Pikiao in Rotorua. 
Um, she provides strategic and policy support for suicide prevention and mental health promotion for the Lakes District. So kia ora mamaroa and thank you for joining us. I'm really looking forward to hearing from you. Um, I know you've done some thinking about the referendum in your organisation, so I was keen to hear what issues relating to cannabis legalisation most interest and inspire you. And yeah, please introduce yourself. Uh, Morina te whānau, uh, heuru tēnei nō Ngāti Pakeao me Ngāti Whakaui me Ngāti Aua, uh, ko mō mairo o mire tōa hau, um, also known as Mosey, uh, and yes, I am, I am currently a tumuaki for Te Mana Akunga, um, so in that space I do a lot with education and with tertiary students, um, Māori tertiary students in particular, um, but I also work for my iwi in suicide prevention, um, and so I'm really here because through the different spaces that I navigate and go through, I see that our current system is not working. Um, and it's disproportionately and negatively impacting um, Māori. And so we really do need to change and shift. And it's been briefly touched on, but I know we're going to go more in depth. Um, change and we need to change um, and shift from focusing on enforcement and punishment and moving resources towards health treatments and interventions. And so that's um, something I, I know as a rangatahi Māori is, is really important that we need to um, push through with this upcoming referendum. Uh, yes, I'll chuck it back to you, Kelly. Kia ora, thanks for that. Um, great to have you here. So. Um, just briefly about this webinar we're holding, this as part of a series, as I mentioned before, um, and it was really clear when we started planning this series that we'd have to have young people as one of the key topics because um, young people in this country, as um, some panelists have already mentioned, are the people who use cannabis the most in this country. They're the ones who are most likely to suffer the adverse effects of cannabis use. Um, they're also the ones who are most likely to be arrested or convicted um, or even imprisoned for cannabis related offences. Um, and this effect is, is obviously amplified of the um, not only young but Māori and male. Um, so it was really important, you know, and, and young people also, I guess, stand the, to lose the most as well if they get convicted because they've got their whole lives um, ahead of them. So it was really important to cover this topic for us. Uh, really um, looking forward to talking to uh, Stella Cast about, about all the different angles. So we're going to, um, I'm going to start with a few questions that I've prepared myself um, just so we cover the bases uh, in the first half of the session and then we'll, um, we'll kick into some Q&A um, after about 20 minutes. So feel free to ask questions as we go. We can also um, put, pull all those in as we go along as well, um, using that Q&A function. So yeah, I'm gonna start with a really chunky, meaty question for you, Tania. Um, I'm just gonna jump straight in there. What, um, from your experience working at Just Speak and elsewhere, um, what do you see as being the biggest impacts of cannabis prohibition on young people? So the status quo on young people. Mm. Um, and do you think that this bill is going to improve uh, those effects, um, you know, cr improve criminal justice outcomes overall for young people? Yeah, um, thanks, Carly. It's, it is a big question, but obviously quite central <laughs> to, um, to why you know, we think that this referendum is such an important opportunity to turn uh, to turn things around for young people in Aotearoa. Um, I think that one of the most pressing issues and probably one that, um, you know, some of the people on the call will be familiar with when it comes to the, the status quo is that it is a kind of a cluster, it creates a cluster of problems that affect uh, young people in, in, in myriad ways, um, all of which combine to either limit their opportunities that they have going, that they have in their life, um, uh, prevent them from accessing education or other opportunities in their life currently. Um, and in some cases, push them into more harmful systems that uh, can cement their life outcomes for, for many decades. Um, one of the biggest problems that we see with uh, the, the status quo around the uh, criminalization of cannabis is not just that it, it um, pushes people into a system that is not geared towards harm prevention or helping them to um, get help for any problematic usage, um, but that it is disproportionately or unequally applied across different areas and across, across different young people, um, largely because of police discretion. Um, and one of the things that we have been working on at Just, at Just Speak over the last year is understanding more, um, I guess at a, at a deeper data level, exactly how that bias, uh, how bias plays out in those decisions that police make. And there are many ways in which that, um, that plays out and they are um, due to a multitude of factors, but probably the most powerful is, the, is this 
systemic racism, particularly against Māori. And what we see is that in, in the way that the that police discretion to pursue young people in particular for, for cannabis use because it is criminalised, is that we see a disproportionate number of young Māori people stuck into the criminal justice system uh, for something that uh, many other people will essentially be um, given a slap on the wrist for. So the law has failed uh, in that respect if, if we which I do believe that the law needs to be applied um, reasonably, proportionately and equally um, to be effective and to be legitimate. So I think that's one of the first most profound problems with our current system is that um, it does not treat everyone equally. Um, and moreover, when, it, when that bias plays out, the people who suffer the consequences uh, most profoundly are people who are systemically, institutionally already, um, already uh, I guess punished and and um, uh, denied access to opportunities and denied um, denied kind of meaningful um, I guess they're, they're denied the opportunity for for the history that has played out in Aotearoa to be accounted for when we're talking about the impacts of colonization um, and the ongoing systemic discrimination against Maori and also against other rangatahi of color <coughs> particularly young Pacifica people excuse me <coughs> So that I think is the, one of the biggest problems that we, we see with the current law. Um, so young people who are underage, so 16 year olds and under who are found with um, cannabis and possessing cannabis or in usage might have the benefit of going through the youth justice system, which is a little more geared towards um, addressing the causes of someone's offending, helping them get support for that, and then using a restorative process to figure out if anyone was harmed and what can be done to prevent that person coming back in front of um, the court again. Um, but obviously, as Carly mentioned earlier, you know, young people, um, sort of 18 or over, um, will end up in the adult criminal justice system, which unfortunately has um, very, very poor outcomes when it comes to helping people get support for problematic drug usage um, and indeed often has the opposite effect of opposite effect of creating these long-term systemic um, consequences for people vastly disproportionate to whatever harm is done by them personally using cannabis um, and that might be the loss of an income, the loss of job, a criminal record um, that prevents them from accessing a lot of opportunities, um, spending time in remand um, which is deeply harmful um, and, and highly disproportionate um, experience when it comes to, you know, particularly for low-level drug usage um, um, and all of the collateral, collateral consequences of incarceration or indeed of just simply being sucked into the court process. So, I mean, drugs really reflect, I guess, the, the criminalisation of cannabis really reflects the wider problem with the criminalisation of a lot of basically social problems in Aotearoa, um, but I think it does so in such a um, such an obviously disproportionate way that it just seems a natural candidate for the change. Um, so, you know, you might assume, but you would like rightly assume from that, that I think that this bill will indeed improve criminal justice outcomes for young people. Um, I think that young people feeling that they, if they have a problematic usage, that they can get help for that without feeling that they're going to be criminalised, that's hugely important. Young people who are caught um, using it, who are under under the what will be the hopefully the legal age, um, I would hope that there would be different outcomes for them in terms of exclusion from education, which is a huge predictive factor um, for pushing people into the criminal justice system and one that we want to see stopped. Um, and I also think that it will it will assist in people being able to um, us to have protection over the kinds of substances, you know, understanding of what kind of substances young people are using, um, rather than relying on the black market. There are a few concerns that we have, um, and I can talk about this later as well. Um, you know, one of the, the problems is, I guess, that age limit. So um, uh, it's a legal substance. For, it will be a legal substance if, if we uh, have a yes vote at the referendum for people over 20. Um, but it's a little unclear as to how that works then for young people um, who are, you know, technically adults um, who currently use it um, and would then not when would be denied access to a legal substance. Um, so I, I think there's the potential for a kind of reverse impact for them when it comes to making sure we protect them from the harms of the justice system and also make sure they, they that stigma of getting help um, or support for, um, 
for their usage. I, yeah, I'm a, a little concerned about that. Um, and I'm concerned about the potential for the proposed fine system um, to escalate to the point where people end up um, in court for a series of unpaid fines, for example, which again defeats the purpose of trying to keep people out of the justice system and keep them in the health um, system and in the community. Uh, I, I think that is a workable solution. I don't think that there is, um, I think there are amendments that we can make to that to, to kind of address those problems. But I do think that if our goal, which I think many people, including people who are wavering on how they might vote or currently don't feel that they, they want to vote yes, you know, a lot of people think that protection of young people is the most important thing with this referendum. And I guess, to, in my mind, the thing we can best do to protect young people is to keep them out of the justice system. That includes people uh, between 18 and 20. So I really want to see some, some thorough discussion of how um, preventing those people of that age from accessing the legal substance will impact them long term. Yeah, that's me for now. <laughs> well, that was a great response to a very um, complicated question. Do other panelists have um, things they want to add there around the, um, you know, the comparison between status quo and legalisation in terms of uh, criminal justice outcomes for young people? I just would um, uh, totally agree with respect to the fine structure um, and issues for when underage people are accessing it because um, if we take, if we look at the most commonly used drug, alcohol, if a person is caught with it underage, it's not a fine or anything like that, and they're certainly not excluded from school or or anything. So I think really we've got a lot of space in here for with the legalization of cannabis to remove those kinds of institutional penalties, but also we no, need to look carefully at that fine structure, and I think. Um, if it does pass, um, put a fair bit of pressure on, on trying to keep those to an absolute minimum or even remove them. And you could uh, bring in a, a Portuguese style health referral or, or, or something like that as an alternative. Mm -hmm. What about from our students? Oh, only to, um, to support what Tanya's saying. Um, I mean, I think it comes into, um, and I have more to say this in relation to the age limit um because i think that we need to be we just need to accept the fact that these age limits can be quite arbitrary in terms of young people still use and we see that in relation to alcohol um and so i think that although there's that inconsistency with other um you know drug and alcohol age limits being 18 and and people being assumed by the state in terms of other regulation and legislation to be an adult at 18 that then having that discrepancy and having the age limit for purchasing um, and using marijuana at 20 um, I think can increase the net or can kind of be inconsistent in terms of our whole approach to um, making this a harms reduction model um, and and you know, moving people away from the criminal justice system, because I worry about those people who can use tobacco and, and alcohol, well, 18 to 20 year olds, um, but are not able to use marijuana. There's a real inconsistency there that I think um, will be good to discuss on this panel. Yep. Mama Roa, did you have anything to add on the, on the age limit while we're talking about that? Uh, I was just going to go back to some stuff that Tanya said, yep. um, just to reiterate. <laughs> Um, that yes, we know that it disproportionately affects Māori in a negative way, um, especially around bias and how police make decisions around discretion or diversion. You know, most people caught with low level offences, like such as possession, um, they don't go through the criminal justice system, except if you're Māori, if you're a male and if you're a youth. Um, and so that's why this, I see this as being so important in changing that and reducing that harm. Um, you know, even with the health not handcuffs, um, page, they have some really good quarter ones and stats there that talk about how 41% of those charged for minor drug offences are Māori and 50% of people in prison for those same offences are Māori. Um, and with that, just reiterating back to what Tanya said, we know there are long-term consequences. And so for rangatahi Māori, you know, if you make a mistake when you're young, that's going to have impacts on you and your whānau for the rest of your life. That, that impacts the ability to travel um, your employment opportunities and what education you get. And so that's why this piece of legislation is so important for us um, to, I don't want to say push through, but um, really sit on and reflect on and, and, and 
will push us really in the, in the right direction that we need to go, which is away from punishment and enforcement um, towards health treatments and services. So that's just what I want to add. And then I'll, I think it's over to you, Izzy. Cool. Well, um, that's really that's really interesting start to the talk. Thanks, guys. I was the, the next thing I wanted to cover off just quickly is um, the the issue around health and mental health. That we know um, that some of, one of the most common objections people have to legalisation um, is that it may negatively affect young people's health uh, and mental health. Um, we've all heard the horror stories about what cannabis can do to um, a cohort of people who use it when they're young or use heavily. Um, you know, schizophrenia, psychosis, demotiv demotivational disorder. So uh, this is a question for Joe. So from your research working on the Christchurch Longitudinal Study, um, how dangerous is cannabis use to young people exactly? And um, of course, then the, is, that follows on to the million dollar question, is increasing, uh, sorry, is legalizing cannabis likely to, to make things worse or better in your view around those health aspects? Well, it's uh, a bit difficult to quantify danger, but I, I'm sort of mindful of the of the fact that if you look at just about any drug drugs harm index around the world, cannabis is a lot lower than, for example, alcohol, which young people use quite a lot of. Um, for one thing, um, just to 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 you know get rid of the the, the worst sort of aspects, it it can't kill you <laughs> using it probably can't kill you unless a giant bale of it falls on you or something like that. Um, but yeah, the, the issues are around a couple of things. One is uh, brain and nervous system development. And so we know that the, the central nervous system is, is loaded with these um, cannabinoid receptors that we've uh, developed over the course of evolution um, that are activated by the presence of THC. And these, in these cannabinoid receptors um, have a lot to do with neurotransmitter activity, including dopamine. And this is the, the plausible, plausible biological pathway by which um, the use of cannabis could increase psychotic symptomatology and why the effects are seen in people who are using more at a younger age and more heavily at a younger age, but not so much for older users. Because by the time you're about 25 years old, these receptors have basically reached what is referred to as their set point and they don't really budge much from that. Um, so really the advice around this uh, that we would provide is if you have, and, and there's this activity is involved in people who've got a family history of psychosis as well. If you have a, a first degree relative with a psychotic illness, you probably shouldn't use cannabis because <laughs> it could make that worse. Um, and if you are younger and using more heavily, it's, it's, it'd be advisable to, to cut back, but it's probably safe for older people. So that's really the, the main issue around that, but the danger is very small. So there was a genetic study out of, um, uh, from the Dunedin study that showed that people who were most susceptible to this had a, a particular variant of the COMP gene, which is a, again, a neurotransmitter regulator. And, and it was amongst those people, about a quarter of the population, um, again, only in the subset of people who were heavy users of cannabis at a young age who showed the susceptibility to psychotic illness. And so really we're talking about a small segment of the population um, and the, the risk wanes as, as people age. Um, so, so there's that sort of biological side of things, but there's also the social side of things. In, and that's where we think a lot of where the demotivational syndrome comes in. Um, because we, in our own study, we found two groups of people, for example, one are young people who started using cannabis when they were young um, and continued to use heavily over their life course. And, and they show these signs of, you know, not completing their education and, and being more likely to suffer longer periods of unemployment and things like that. And there's another group who are also uh, later in their life chronic cannabis users, but really didn't use much until they were in their mid twenties, but they show the same kind of syndrome, but they already showed signs of this before they started using cannabis which suggests that this is a sort of as a social problem as much as anything else, um, rather than the use of the substance, that there could be arguably the existence of a, of a culture around it that, um, that is, serves to demotivate people who are, who are engaging in this culture. 
So I guess the, the short answer is it's, um, it's, it's a little dangerous. It's certainly less dangerous than some other activities. Um, and in terms of legalizing it, um, one of the things, one of the goals in this, and one of the reasons why a lot of us in the public health sphere push for a, a higher age of purchase for, for cannabis is that um, when you look at a, a, an age of purchase, you, you have to think about the fact that uh, they did what you call the real age and the de facto age. Now, the real age for per purchase for alcohol is 18, but we call, we call 16 the de facto age because if you're 16, you probably have reasonable access to it with older friends and relatives and things like that. So we have to think that probably with cannabis, it's going to be the same thing, the real age 18 or real age 20, de facto age 18, because there will certainly be you know, some flouting of the law or in terms of providing access to it from young people. Um, but the issue is that in terms of public health, we want to reduce access in a legal regime, reduce access for young people, um, simply because it's, it's more dangerous at younger ages. Um, and we've seen with the relative success of tobacco control over the last 30 to 40 years in terms of reducing access to tobacco to young people, um, that a legal regime with strict um, regulations actually works in this regard. Um, and certainly better than the situation we have now with a, uh, whereby anybody who can, you know, walk into a tinny house or other source um, will, be, will be sold to um, because there's no IDs checked at the door. Um, and similarly, to, we have to consider the fact that um, in terms of product safety, um, knowing what is in, a, we will know in terms of legal products, what is what the THC content, CBD content, and, and we know that the product is pure and hasn't been adulterated or tampered with in any way. Um, and that will actually improve product safety and improve the health of people, including young people who are using it. Right, that was fascinating, thank you. Um, did anyone else have anything to add on the health stuff, <clears throat> on the health issues and when whether legalization will make those um, health issues potentially worse or better or? This is, this is kind of an, um, a bit of a branch out, but generally in, in relation to health and actually I've seen a question <laughs> on the Q&A about this in relation to um, health education and the way that our secondary schools in particular can begin to shift the narrative. I mean, I was, um, you know, at school five years ago, and the health education that I received in relation to a drug and alcohol, and I'm sure all young people watching this would would feel exactly the same, was terrible. We were put up these pictures of people who, um, and and had these kind of videos showed to us and these demonstrations about what happens if you use drugs and the kind of extremities of the situation. We were never provided with a space to actually understand the impacts of drug and alcohol to have open dialogue and everyone in the class was obviously had already experimented um or most people had experimented with drug and alcohol um and this is from you know kind of 14 15 year olds but there was this whole culture of kind of um i guess abstinence and not using it was the kind of key and i think it comes back to the fact that one of the the key benefits and i guess one of the the, the real issues that we have to get right if we want to realize the benefits of this particular piece of legislation is that the changing the narrative and the culture um, it's all very well to, to change the legislation but unless we accompany that with a culture shift in the way that we teach people about drug and alcohol use and about addiction um, and the way that we uh, and young people can engage in the system and actually seek help instead of be um, punished by using it um, is so important and the way that we need to do that is through our health education because at the moment um, it will completely contradict all of the public health messages if this goes through in September unless we also change that and we change the way that our schools and our education system deal with um, young people using drugs and alcohol. Yeah and I see a question just been asked whether you think that legalizing will help change the culture around um, around how we teach um, drug and alcohol education in schools and actually have that impact just by virtue of solely of legalizing whether it will actually be easier to teach um, better quality um, drug and alcohol education in schools. 
Yeah, I mean, I think that, I mean, the alcohol is legal in our, in our education around um, the usage of alcohol, I think is also very poor. Um, and I, so I don't think that parents or students necessarily have a good model in that regard. So I think, you know, I hope that the benefits roll out into alcohol as well and have this general discussion around uh, drugs and alcohol. Um, so, yeah, I think that maybe legalization will have a play in destigmatizing um, and will bring it into the open instead of young people feeling like they can't actually um, talk about their experiences and talk about the ways that they can do it in a safe way and that they can experiment um, and, and, you know, have it with their friends and family instead of kind of hiding in the closet or the back of the party um, and smoking a joint. You know, this is where the harm is taking place among our young people because they feel like they can't talk about it. And if something goes wrong, then they don't want to talk about it because they're scared of the ramifications that are going to happen as a result, whether that's within the school system and the education system or whether we're within the criminal system. And that's if they don't get caught already. Right. And Tania, I think you had something to add there. Yeah, just to add, I think there's a lot of parallels here with how we talk about having to change attitudes around justice as well, um, that we know that people's fear um, and their belief that punishment is a deterrent um, drives a lot of why we have the kind of um, deeply ineffective and harmful justice system that we do. Um, and there's a lot of connections to the way that we conceive of um, how we can educate and support people to, um, you know, use drugs safely or not use them if they don't want to. But, you know, it, it, there's that, that underpinning of attitude, that punitive attitude um, that demonstrates that it's, in a, it's deeply ineffective, but I think um, a lot of people feel fearful about trying to talk about it in a different way and that the, the, safe, the safe way to do it is to talk about abstinence, as Isabella has said, or to... Um, to actually push people away from formal from edu from the education system or from from their peers um, out of fear of their their usage affecting others so um, one would hope that in moving towards a health-based approach and moving away from a punitive justice approach um, gets us further towards that collective goal of understanding how we can work uh, restoratively and kind of and kind of compassionately with young people um, to if they if they're using either, you know, if they're using underage or at the moment if they're using illegal substances in a way that doesn't get to that kind of fear and punishment response that comes back to the, the ultimate, the, the stronger value around um, supporting young people to be included, um, supporting young people to, to get help for any problematic usage that they have. Um, but I think it is a long-term shift. And I think one of the, um, the other connections between the kind of justice, um, Kind of co papa and um, and drug usage is that a lot of us learn those behaviours around um, that instinct towards punishment, that instinct to push away people who aren't behaving in a way that we agree with at school, you know, and, and in, in parenting. Um, so I think that if we start to dismantle those attitudes and those behaviours around excluding people, um, pushing them away rather than helping them address their problems, that will um, the the way that young people learn from that and the way that teachers and parents learn from that, I think will, will be so beneficial in many, many ways beyond uh, drug usage and, and, um, and, and the legalization kind of uh, question. Yep. Mama Roa. Um, just to add on to that, um, as you briefly mentioned that, yes, there's definitely a stigmatization there. Um, and, you know, for as rangatahi, there's a focus on abstinence. Um, and I find the current system we're in concerning because, you know, there are some people, some rangatahi that um, aren't experimenting, are actually using and uh, struggling with substance abuse. And when there's that stigmatization there, um, they struggle to engage with services, you know, to get the help that's needed. And there's huge fear around the conviction, you know, being punished. Um, and so that's why I, where I think this legislation can step in and, and just to reiterate the quarter it's come, shift from justice um, into education and health. Kia ora. Kia ora, that's right. And also, Tane, you mentioned earlier on um, in your talk about how uh, children or young people are less likely to be removed from school um, if cannabis was legal, because currently a lot of people are made to leave school um, for cannabis use in a way that they aren't for um, alcohol use. So presumably that would that would improve under a legal market as well. Yeah, I think obviously, like, if there are still restrictions, if there's an age limit, so if it's, you know, not legal for young people, that still creates that kind of 
barrier in the mindsets of parents and um, boards of trustees and, and teachers where it's that kind of that fear and anxiety around um, around kind of norm breaking. But I think that the closer we get to a substance that is controlled and regulated, um, the more able, the more supported I would hope that people in the education system feel mm -hmm. to work through it kind of um, in an evidence-based manner. Um, uh, rather than kind of then push people away and you know being excluded from from education is such a huge um, it's so damaging to people's lives to young people's mm -hmm. lives and, and the, the formal education system is not for everyone there are there are better systems for some people but that needs to be something that people young people make a choice that young people make um, themselves and with their final family but that that kind of punitive of kicking people out because of the stigma of something illegal I think is um is really something we need to get away because it obviously it affects young people um who are kicked out for behavioral reasons as well it's, it's all part of that same attitudinal problem um but I think if we can take away that that sort of specious reasoning of you know illegal substance equals um punishment and dismissal then we can help to keep more young people, keep more young people safe. And I think that's, mm -hmm. that's a really valid goal. Great. I wanted to just um, take a slight change of direction and, and ask Mamoto or something. Um, so through the bill, there are a lot of different um, there are a lot of efforts in the bill to protect young people in lots of different ways. And some examples are there's a rule in there about not using cannabis in front of young people in the family home um, or anywhere. There's a rule about not using when you're under the age of 20, which Joe uh, mentioned before. Um, whereas there's no corresponding rule for alcohol use. Um, I was wondering if there was any specific pr provisions in the bill that jumped out as you as either good or bad from a young person's perspective, and especially from a, a Maori young person's perspective. Um, you know, are there any potential unintended consequences in the bill that we need to think about for young people? Um, you know, what's good, what's bad? What stuff we haven't covered before, perhaps. Yeah, I feel like I may just be a little bit reiterating myself and uh, the cordial that we've had. But um, I think that in, in general, this piece of legislation is a step in the right direction. Um, just yeah, shifting resources away from enforcement and punishment into healthcare and interventions. Um, it's, a, it's a good step in improving wellbeing for Māori and redu reducing the inequities that we've talked about. Um, in, in general, I know it's the main copa bill is about reducing harm, um, increasing access to support services, removing stigmatization, um, eliminating the long-term consequences of criminal convictions. That's the good, that's the overarching good that I see from this. Um, some of the bad, you know, the parts where I think this legislation could have been better. Um, I, I take issue with the fact that Māori were not consulted as strongly as they could have been when it came to the development of this. I know that was that was mentioned in the corridor earlier. Um, not with us, with the one preceding us. Um, I do think there needs to be a greater partnership with Fano and co-developing the regulatory model for legal cannabis. Um, seeing as how it disproportionately affects us, I think we do, I don't think, I know we need to be a part of that, um, co-leading and co-developing um, all of the stuff that's gonna impact our whanau. Um, I also picked up that there are some cultural differences, which I see as a problem. Um, and I know this has been touched on and I've talked to some of my friends about it around, um, one of the points in there mentions that you can't have more per adult, you can't grow more than two plants each. And so in one household, you're only allowed no more than four. But when you think about Māori and our whānau and how many adults we have living in our houses, that's just, that's not, you know, that's not unreasonable for us. And so does that mean we're going to still be breaking the law? Uh, and I think that's something that, that's just one point where I see a cultural difference coming in. Um, but definitely if we get this across this line, there needs to be more thought given to the full extent of how we, we do deliver this and put it across. Um, I do see an issue with over-policing. Uh, so kind of links into the cultural differences that we have, um, how there's gonna be a greater sense of control around the use of cannabis in public spaces. Um, what, how is that gonna affect our homeless whanau? You know, we have a high proportion of homeless who may be using this drug and when it's legalized, you know, is it, are they going to be, can they do it, you know, sorry, I keep saying, you know, but how is this going to directly impact them? Um, and just in, in regards to um, the review that's been, that's been proposed, so that's in five years, I think that's way too long. 
um, to wait five years to do a review, that it should be a constant evaluation and making changes as soon as we see that there, there are needs are not being met or there's, you know, there's hiccups coming up. Um, and the other thing I wanted to quote it all was just, and Kylie had actually mentioned it in a, in a previous webinar that um, to ensure that there was parity of access. So ensuring that there are health services and spaces where it's dispensed um, because we don't want, uh, you know, low socioeconomic status, um, socially socioeconomic deprived areas um, to have all of these dispensaries, but not have any health services or treatments available for Māori in those communities. So that's a big concern that I have. Um, and that's it. I'll pass it over. Hopefully I answered the question. <laughs> No, definitely. That was really some really interesting points came out there. Did anyone else have anything that they're worried about in terms of potential unintended consequences of the bill or bits they wanted to highlight that haven't come out yet um, that they're particularly um, worried about? Um, just echoing that, I do think that it's not specifically how it affects young people, but um, the, the penalties for supplying to young people um, are really harsh and I think they, they, they vary quite significantly different to um, penalties associating with supplying alcohol or drugs to young people and I, I think that I don't understand the rationale for that frankly I think that that um, again when we're talking about um, what the point of, of a kind of, of, of a kind of, of a justice system intervention in this is if it's about harm prevention then sending someone to prison you know having the, the, the um, penalty be a, a not insignificant stint in prison is quite serious to me and I think that there's been a failure on the part of the, the drafters of the bill to explain why providing that a substance a controlled substance to young people um, why it's different across the three you know um, and and I think um, not to say that people breaking um, the rules that are set up on a health basis is something we should encourage obviously not but again like what is achieved by that um, and and is that proportionate when we're trying, you know, when I think this government's stated goal is to keep is to prevent more people from being pulled into a justice system that doesn't doesn't give it deliver us good outcomes. Um, I think I think that's a real issue, and I'd like to see a little more discussion around that specifically. Um, and just to echo um, Maimaroa's points about um, about the kind of cultural assumptions embedded in the bill, I think there's a lot there that. Um, that leaves something to be desired when it comes to bearing in mind that we're moving from a system where lots of people will be have been will continue to grow their own um, how we don't end up criminalizing people who currently probably wouldn't necessarily be whipped you know they wouldn't be targeted they will be targeted but they wouldn't be the I, like people growing um, plants for personal use ought not to be targeted even under the current regime because that just should not be a priority we don't want to end up in a situation where because they fall foul of these quite stringent limitations on on what they're growing at home end up um, being kind of you know outside of the law even though again the entire intent is to keep it um, keep a health-based model um, so I would agree that that a, a more more constant review of that um, particularly when it comes to undoing or and untangling the harm that has been done to the Māori whānau with the criminalisation of cannabis so far um, that we don't end up, there's not some adverse kind of an unintended consequences there. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Um, there's a question here from a, an attendee wondering about um, whether the um, cannabis referendum might turn out more young voters. Is this something you'd be keen to answer, Isabella? Do you think um, this is going to bring out young voters and get them enrolled in a way we've not seen previously? Is it something that motivates um, students and young people? Yeah, well, I think that, I mean, you know, everyone has their perspectives on why young people are disengaged and disenfranchised, but I think largely it's because the system isn't built for us to engage in. Um, and when we see politicians and our decision makers debating in, um, you know, the debating ch chamber at Parliament and we see this zoo happening, I think that immediately young people are completely put off because not only is their process around decision making in New Zealand inaccessible to young people, but also substantively um, we see very little in terms of direct legislation and laws that provide benefit to our lives um, simply because we are either locked out of being able to vote um, or we um, the system isn't designed in a way that we can you know if you look at a select committee process I mean it's not really conducive to young people having um, 
the ability to have their voice heard because you need to be able to really know and navigate that particular system and the lack of civics education in New Zealand means that it's incredibly hard for young people to engage in a system they have no idea about. I think that the reason why this is a real really powerful referendum in terms of engaging young, young people is that we have an issue on the table um, that isn't about party politics, that is about an issue that young people have a direct um, say and personal kind of relationship with and in that way I see there's a real opportunity to shift this tide around young people are lazy and don't engage and this kind of deficit model of of you know talking about young people and our engagement in politics and to saying this is actually an issue that young people care deeply about and young people care deeply about lots of issues it's just that on lots of these ways we're not actually included in this, this the system or the decision making but this is one way that we can actually tangibly engage um, and have a real kind of lasting and powerful impact um, if there is you know a, an overwhelming consensus on yes and I think that I mean I don't um, for one minute want to say that young people are, are a homogenous group of people that all have a similar um, viewpoint but I think that largely um, young people because we've seen the harms personally or with our friends or with our whanau um, that this is a this is an issue that we can bring that personal experience and actually have our personal experience validated in terms of coming to a referendum and, and being able to partake, partake in that democratic process. Yeah, great answer. Thank you. Um, we've got another, another question come in from uh, Gary, which I think might be, Joe would be the best person to answer. Can the panel quote it all to gender differences of young people in the areas of current usage, arrest, aversion, health, etc.? Well, speaking about the, the data we know from longitudinal studies that cannabis is in those groups of people who are now in their 40s, uh, a largely male activity. Um, so if you look at rates of um, cannabis use disorder, for example, over the life course, males have more than double the rate than, than females. Having said that, overseas data suggests that this gap is actually narrowing. So while, and, and it's quite possibly due to the fact, uh, the effect of age cohorts. So younger groups are actually more, more equal in terms of gender distribution of involvement with cannabis um, than older groups are, older groups had been. So it just as a, a, a funny example, we, we track people in terms of being daily users of cannabis over a course of years. And, and there's a group of people, for example, who had been daily users for five years or more. And of, of those people who were a small fraction of the cohort, um, there was one woman, <laughs> um, the rest were all men. Uh, but now I think that it's becoming much more, uh, much more equal across gender. Right. Of course, then, if males are more likely to be arrested and convicted, of course. <laughs> yeah, I was just gonna, I was just gonna ask about that. Um from your cohort study and just widely, we know that males are, what is it, something like 80% um, more likely to be arrested for cannabis. Is that right? Or have I made that up? Uh, it, roughly correct, yes. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Excellent. Um, I have an interesting question here just about whether students are planning any activism around the referendum. Um, Mamaroa or Isabella? I'm not sure who's the best answer for that one. I think both of our organisations, um, so both um, NZUSA and Te Mana Aukunga um, are, are going to be publicly campaigning on yes. I think um, what traditional activism might look like for older people is quite different among young people. Um, we might not be, you know, going out. Well, I mean, I, I think, you know, lots of young people in, in the last couple of years have been marching on the streets, but I don't think this is necessarily one where you're going to see mass protests. This is going to be one where people are organising in different ways um, and really using social media to talk about it. Um, I think, though, that the powerful thing about cannabis is that there are personal experiences that can really be validated in these discussions. And I think that that's where um, I know from my organisation, we're, we're really going to be supporting young people to feel like their personal experience or their whanau's uh, experience in relation to um, drug and alcohol use can really be brought into the discussion and that they can feel like um, this is a, a kind of a safe space for them to really reflect on their own experiences and their whanau's experiences um, to guide them in a way and to um, increase their knowledge and that kind of evidence that I think Joe's brought to this discussion um, and, and Tanya in the justice space to enable them to vote with confidence um, going into September. Yep. Did you have anything to add there, Mamero? Yeah, just to 
on a tangent, so for us, the big um, raru that we have is that in the last election, 40% of rangatahi between the ages of 18 to 29 um, didn't even vote. So we have a, um, a problem on our hands where we know that um, we need to do a huge drive just to get rangatahi to come in, to have the ability to vote. Um, and touching into what Isabella said, um, using the mechanisms that they engage in to share this information, that's, a big, that's an important thing for us. Um, making sure that they're informed and educated about you know the the true extent to the harm that's being caused and how this legislation can be used to minimize it um but for us yeah we've got a little bit of a um uh, a little bit a lot of mahi on our hands just in, in regards to poor voter turnout for maori rangatahi in general yeah and i guess um the um conundrum there is that the people who are most likely to be yes voters are young and maori um but they're also least likely to be enrolled so getting them out voting is, is really important um we're running at low on time but there's another question come in that i really wanted to get to if we can answer it quickly so it's from dave and he said um critics of the proposed bill have claimed young people will have better access to cannabis through commercial outlets than they than they currently do i think he means um and the way that they obtain alcohol do panelists think this is likely given the provisions of the cannabis control bill, which are stronger than those around the sale and supply of alcohol? Who wants to answer that one? Any 15 year old with NAUS can at this moment go out and get cannabis, right? Who's got a bit of knowledge, knows a few people, they can go and do it now. Two years from now, if this passes and we have a legal framework in place, it's going to be that much harder. So we saw, for example, in Canada, um, in 2018, the year they legalized cannabis, 19% of 15 to 17 year olds reported having used it. The following year, 2019, when all the legal regulations were put in place and they moved about 50% of the cannabis from the illicit market to the illicit market, mm. over the course of that year, 15 to 17 year olds, only 10% reported using cannabis in the past 12 months, which means if you if you put it behind barriers, it's harder to get to. And at the moment, prohibition is not a barrier. It's it's or, or the modified prohibition that we're working with now. That's it's just not a barrier. Yeah. Anyone else want to add on to that? It was a pretty um pretty good comprehensive reply, wasn't it? <laughs> Hey, look, guys, I'm really mindful that we're running out of time. I would love this conversation to go on for the next two hours. It's so interesting. And I've, I've just I've learned a lot as well from hearing from you guys. And, and thank you so much for joining us. Um, but we do we do have to sort of pull it to a close. Um, but conversations can keep going on social media on our Drug Foundation page where we've been streaming this live. Um, feel free to, to jump in there and, and keep the conversation going if you'd like to. Um, also, don't forget, we've got a series of, of webinars that have all been recorded and they're on our website. So you can have a look at the, um, the other ones as well. And, and and check those out and in two weeks we're, we're welcoming a, a special guest Helen Clark which will be great for our final um, our final webinar which is the case for um, the case for change um, and so it'd be great to have her there so make sure you sign up for that one as well um, I also wanted to give a really quick shout out to Health Not Handcuffs, which Mama Roa mentioned earlier, um, which is a coalition of organisations working towards um, change in our drug law towards a, a health rather than a criminal justice approach. Uh, and they're coming out in favour of a yes vote. So if you're keen to get involved in any kind of campaigning around um, cannabis legalisation, um, please do sign up there. Um, yeah, so this recording will be on Facebook Live and it will be on our YouTube channel and it will be on our website as well. So if you missed any of today's session, um, you can catch up on that afterwards. I saw one person was having trouble with sound, um, so hopefully she'll be able to catch up uh, later and, and watch that. Um, so yeah, just um, a massive thank you to our panelists who have just um, shared so many interesting insights um, and such a great wealth of knowledge on this topic. And um, thank you guys, enjoy the rest of your day and thanks to our, to our audience for coming along. I hope you enjoyed it. See you later, Good everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Bye.